Hi gang, Rob here. It is the evening of 9 April 2018. Coming to you with a video I bet lots of you have been waiting for. You see in front of the Apostle P camera, what, seven knives that were all sent to me uh, by my customer, Daniel. And thank you very much, Daniel, <clears throat> for allowing us to look at your mistakes. Um, <laughs> the topic of tonight's video is what not to do when sharpening your knives. And this, I guess, will specifically relate to fixed angle sharpening systems where the knife stays put and you're moving a, uh, uh, a specifically shaped stone in a fixture across the edge. So that would cover Wicked Edge, Edge Pro, KME, and clones, okay? The principles also apply to freehand sharpening, but sort of in reverse, and we're really not going to go there because uh, you freehand guys, <laughs> you've already learned. I know you have. So <clears throat> we're going to kind of go through this step by step, and we're going to use Daniel's knives to illustrate some common mistakes, and I think Daniel is specifically an Edge Pro user, okay? So some of this has to do with technique. Some of it has to do with the fact that many, many modern knife designers have never sharpened a knife and never used a knife, apparently, because they design knives in such a way that sharpening maintenance is all but impossible, especially in that one crucial area of the knife. And I know you know what I'm talking about viewers of this channel we're talking about the where the cutting edge the choil the ricasso the plunge grind all converge okay and the difficulty we're talking about i think is pretty obvious if we look at this knife uh -huh. so that's one of the things we're going to look at we're also going to look at uh, tips How not to do that, how not to round up your tip. And that's a very common difficulty new sharpeners have, even old sharpeners have on bad days. Let's see if I can find a more spectacular one than that. Now this pair of two is not looking too pretty. Okay, we're also going to talk about choosing an angle, okay, to sharpen your knives at based on cutting performance, primary bevel geometry, <clears throat> so how thick and how steep is the angle of the face of the blade, the main bevel, and also, again, what problems are going to be caused in this area of the knife if we choose to acute an angle which this knife suffers from, okay? Um, <clears throat> when to use a micro bevel, when not to. And then we'll also talk about, just briefly, because I'm not going to set up my Edge Pro to illustrate this, but how to maintain your angle between grits in such a fashion that your scratches from the previous lower grit are cleaned up most expeditiously by your next stone. And it's not the answer most of you are thinking. We'll also talk about a sort of spider coat specific difficulty when we have this tight 90 degree plunge grind, plunge grind and a, a factory edge that isn't sharpened all the way back. How do we deal with that and get it to look right? Not necessarily like this, okay? But before we get into all that, I want to talk a little bit about preparation of your equipment and this will be largely Edge Pro specific and preparation of the knife blade so you don't get that okay so I'm going to clear these blades out of the way and we're going to start talking shop just a little bit Okay, preparation. 
First, we're going to start with the stones. This is a freshly flattened, resurfaced 600 grit Edge Pro stone. It is completely flat. It has sharp corners that will become important as we move along. No matter what point of the knife blade any part of the stone is touching, the angle is going to be the same with an asterisk. And we'll, we'll get into that as we go along. There are no uh, there are no dished areas. There are no high spots. It's a flat stone. That will alleviate a lot of frustration. If your stones start to get cupped or dished, if your corners start to get round, you get problems. And we'll kind of talk about them as we go along. So you want to keep your stones flat. How do you do that? Well, there are a lot of ways to do that. You can use a garden hose on a piece of finely grained concrete. You can use uh, you can use diamond plates like this one. My chosen method is to use a piece of glass with this stuff. This is a uh, was 140 grit, I believe, silicon carbide dust that I buy from Edge Pro. I use a piece of glass and some soapy water. Uh, Edge Pro stones when they're new are going to look like this. This is that same 600. Notice it's much darker than this one and this is the same stone. Why is it darker? Well much like concrete when these synthetic stones are poured there's a cream that comes to the surface. Just you know when you watch them pour concrete when they first pour you can see the rock sticking up and then as it as it starts to cure, the fine cream comes to the top and sort of covers up the rocks and then you can almost put a shiny finish on concrete if you have the right tools to do it with, bringing that cream to the top and getting it to cure over. Well, these stones do that. So you new Edge Pro users, if you're going right to work with your Edge Pro with a stone that looks like that, you're going to notice that very quickly it's going to build up a bunch of black stuff and it's not going to cut. <clears throat> you want to do a leveling to break that glaze before you ever start. You'll see how far to go, but as a rule of thumb, when the ink is gone, you're ready to rock. <clears throat> if you see dark, shiny spots anywhere, you're not done. You need to keep going. Once you've exposed the abrasive by that first flattening or breaking that glaze, you're ready to sharpen. Um, just had a, a a customer texts back and forth with me over the last week or so asking why my new stones don't cut. He had sent them into Edge Pro already and Ben uh, deglazed them for him, leveled them and sharpened some knives, made sure they cut and sent them back. So you got to do that and then as you use them you want to keep them flat because if you have a if you have a low spot in your stone that's a 32nd of an inch you know that may change your angle half a degree in that one spot. So you're going to notice if you've got a bunch of high and low spots in your stones, cleaning up the scratches from your previous grit is, uh, well, it's like chasing a unicorn. You just can't do it because you don't have consistently angled abrasive in contact with your cutting edge. Very important to level your stones, <clears throat> both before use and then after you use them a little bit. You'll kind of know when it's time, by the way. Uh, okay, that's one thing we wanted to talk about. Next, preparation of the knife. Okay, let's look at a full flat ground Spyderco Paramilitary 2. They come with a beautiful factory satin from Golden Colorado USA Earth. And this one's been completely boogered. I'm not sure how this happened, but I'm going to use these scratches just as an attention getter. If you lay this blade down on your Edge Pro table, just from moving it around, moving the stone across the knife, uh, it, it's going to move on that table and because you're sharpening a knife, you're freeing up abrasive in a slurry, it's going to get under there and you're going to be grinding abrasive material into the face of your blade. So what you want to do, and after trying numerous products for this process, I have arrived at this. I mask my blades with United States Postal Service clear mailing tape 
It'll be in your locked glass cabinet with the other ready post supplies. It is a very heavy, very consistent thickness, very abrasion resistant tape with super waterproof adhesive. Um, I never have to reapply this during five or six steps of sharpening a blade. It stays put. So, how do you put it on? And I'm not going to use this tape to show you because it's clear and you can't see it. So I'm going to grab a piece of yellow masking tape and show you how I do this. So I'm going to lay that tape a little bit off the shoulder because I'm going to need to move it back. I'm going to lay it so the the base of that tape is coming in contact with the very edge of the cutting edge. And then I'm going to use my handy dandy Victorinox Spartan. My pen blade is employed almost exclusively for this task. I'm going to cut that tape. Just sort of riding above the edge. So hard to do through the camera. Kind of boogered up my tip. Then I'm going to peel the tape. I'm going to pull it back to the shoulder and I'm going to bring it about a sixteenth of an inch above where my secondary bevel stops. Checking to be sure that I have reveal all the way to the tip because if I start getting into my tape during sharpening it really messes things up. Now I would do a clear piece of packing tape and then cut it off at the spine. So you can see how that's going to protect my blade. So I'll do one side and then cut it to the spine. When I do the other side, I'm going to fold that tape over the spine and then trim the far side so my spine is protected against the stop on my edge pro. So that's going to give me a protected blade. And I'm going to leave that tape on there all the way through the stropping process on most knives, especially knives that have really delicate satins, like a Benchmade standard finish with their sort of coarse satin with a light stone wash over and kind of a coarsely finished spine. I don't, I strop without the tape on these and then I don't really worry about the spine because <clears throat> it's kind of featureless and it's already kind of coarse. It doesn't really get marred up. So that's how I protect blade faces. And guys, trust me, that clear packing tape is the stuff. Uh, masking tape gets wet and falls off and shreds and um, that stuff works. It really, really does. Been using it for thousands of knives. Okay, so level, sharp cornered stones, well protected blades. The key, okay? The key. Alright, now, what do I do in between grits? Um, if you've read, if you've watched my tutorial videos, you know that I have been a big advocate of the uh, the drill stop collar that you can buy on Chef Knives to Go. There's the one they sell as a super high quality collar. It doesn't rock back and forth on the standard um, because you can using an angle finder. You can use that stop collar when you're switching grits. Use your angle finder, which is an iPhone in this case. Um, to change the height of the back of the arm on your edge pro to make sure that you're you're sharpening at the same angle regardless of the thickness of the stone. Now, <clears throat> I have gone away from that and I've started using a sharpie. Here's why. Uh, I might even have a flat stone, but let's say during my flattening process, during my sharpening process, you know, maybe I've worn away during sharpening this area of the stone. So when I flattened it, maybe I bear down on that a little bit. So I end up with some side to side variation in thickness, maybe even some end to end. So if I'm using an angle finder and I'm laying that, laying that stone down in one place on the stone on one place of the edge, I might have one angle and, but as I'm sharpening, 
that might have been, let's say, the lowest or the highest point on that stone. So my other areas really aren't making contact with my cutting edge, and I have a heck of a time getting scratches out. Instead, I started doing this. I color that edge, that bevel with a Sharpie. I take a good educated guess how much to raise or lower the stone based on the perceived thickness difference. And then I run the whole length of that stone across that whole length of Sharpie and I tweak it until one pass removes all that Sharpie left to right, top to bottom. So one angle reading at one point on an edge at one point on a stone might look really good because it's so precise down to tenths or hundredths of degrees, but it doesn't really mean much because it's not a big enough sample. What I really need to see is how is that stone going to perform across that edge front to back, side to side. So in this case, less precision is more precise, if that makes sense. I think it does. How many of you angle finder guys have dialed that angle in and then you take a few strokes and you notice I'm not cleaning up my scratches. I got to go up a little or I got to go down a little. You know what I'm talking about. Kind of goes to a, a, a larger point I wanted to make too. That because um, <laughs> I have conversations with guys having problems asking questions about using Edge Pro or a Wicked Edge or Cami. Those machines are all great, and they're you know they all have advantages and disadvantages to be sure. Um, but none of them, none of them, can make a bad knife sharpener good. <laughs> you you have to kind of know what it is you're trying to achieve, and you have to know the mechanics of how your own hands work, um, and you have to know what makes an edge sharp, what makes a sharp edge perform. Uh, you, it's not like you stick a knife in a wicket edge, set a timer, turn it on, and come back in half an hour and you have a perfect knife. Your hands still have to interact. Your, <clears throat> your fingertips, feeling an edge, have to, have to communicate with your brain. Your eyes have to see, even under magnification. And then your hands and your, your mind have to know what to do to correct the situation that's not quite right. As you're moving that stone with your hand across that edge, you have to know what pressures and what angles and uh, what contour of the, of the profile of the blade require you to do certain things. And <clears throat> until you've frankly wrecked a lot of knives, we don't really learn this. So, um, that's the larger point. Okay, so we've covered st uh, stone preparation. We've covered blade preparation. Next, how do we choose an angle? Well. Let's see, let's look at a knife that the that Daniel actually chose an angle that's probably pretty right. This is a, a Gale Bradley 1 and CPM M4. Uh, these blades are ground really thinly, usually about 17 thousandths behind the edge. I'm, I'm guessing that Daniel has sharpened this at 15 degrees per side, maybe 16. <clears throat> I've taken some Gale Bradleys down into the 12 or 13 range and the bevels don't get overly broad. It's, this one's probably 15 or 16, which is a plenty fine angle for this knife. Plenty fine. Uh, let's let's contrast that though. Let's look at let's look at Daniel's 940. Th this is a knife that's been over sharpened. I'm looking at this blade, thinking in its lifetime, before it ever saw an Edge Pro, it got run through a knife shredder, you know, a power sharpener of some kind, which you know gave us these nice scratches. So there's not much of this blade left. If you look at this 940 compared to my 940, you can see you can see the difference in blade height. Um, so a knife that's been over sharpened, so lots of material has been removed here. Daniel has tried to sharpen again, probably at 15, maybe even 14 degrees. And not only does he have a bevel that looks overly broad, he really started causing himself problems back here. There's uh, on a Benchmade 940 without a choil modification, the plunge grind isn't finished until about right where my thumbnail is. To get back to this corner, 
you make yourself do all kinds of things that are destructive. He's gotten into the he's gotten into the choil area and caused a big flare. He's actually bitten his handle. If you think that one's bad, look at this one. This is a two hundred and seventy dollar nine forty dash one, and he has ground away a big chunk of carbon fiber on both sides, uh, trying to get back to that. Trying to get back to the base of the edge and it's not working out. Um, using way too way too acute an angle there. So what I've discovered on bench maids, on most bench maids, like the 940. Um, here is a what is that? A bench made valet. Here's a gray G10 griptilian. They all like 17 degrees per side. It looks right. It still cuts well. It lets you do a choil modification and get the base of the edge right without causing problems, okay? Um, spider Co's, other, other than the Bradleys, the GB1 and the GB2, most Spider Co's are going to want between 15 and 17. I normally do pair of twos at 16 degrees per side, okay? Um, so you kind of have to walk this line of is the is the secondary bevel aesthetically fitting to the design of the knife blade can i do can i sharpen it at an angle that's still going to cut well and is the angle i choose going to cause problems anywhere in the knife because of the way it's designed okay so that's sort of my equation um, <clears throat> if i'm using a very acute um, let, you know, let's say I did a pair of two at 15 degrees or 16, and I got a fairly broad secondary bevel. I'm probably going to micro bevel that because subsequent sharpenings are much easier if you're just kissing an apex rather than wiping a really broad secondary bevel all the way top to bottom. Um, also, it gives it a little more stability. Um, Here's, a, here's an interesting curveball. Let's say I sharpened a Gale Bradley at 16 degrees per side. It's CPM M4. It is super tough and super wear resistant. I might go 16 degrees no micro because it's going to be a very, very short, not tall, secondary bevel that touch-ups will still be quick on. But I get that super keen 16 degree per side geometry. I do that on some knives. And I also do it on knives that are super thick, like a Hinder or XM18. Uh, <laughs> it's a freaking wedge. Actually, it's not even a wedge because it doesn't come to a point. I, if I sharpen an XM18 at 20 degrees per side, my bevel still looks pretty wide. I don't want to put a 23 or 4 degree micro bevel on it because then it won't cut. So a lot of times on hinderers, I just choose to make them 20 degrees all the way to the apex because uh, they just suck. There's not much you can do about it as cutting tools. Um, great, great, uh, great knife, well built, um, super strong. They just don't cut real well. Okay, what do we want to talk about next? Let's talk about. Well, let's talk about the the elephant in the room, shall we? You guys hear me talk about this very seldom, if ever, have I had a knife in front of the camera that actually exhibits this. Look down this, this secondary bevel. Notice how it's sort of thin back here. Then it flares way up. Look, look here about an inch out. Inch, inch and a quarter. See how it gets big again? And I, I know I say this a lot. You end up with a, a, with a recurve right here. Because, because of this plunge grind not being finished by the time you get to the base of the edge, what happens is, obviously, looking at the knife like this, if, if I'm trying to sharpen all the way back here, because the plunge grind is going up, it's bringing my stone, instead of sitting parallel to the knife blade, it's kicking it up. So as I'm running that as I'm running that knife over or that stone over the knife, look at the right side of the stone. What's it doing? Well, yeah, it's digging. And it's digging this hole right here, this recurve and this broadened edge. It looks terrible. Makes it hard to touch up. 
So how do you avoid that? And instead get that. Well, those of you who are my sharpening customers know how I do it. If you look very closely into the choil, you'll see that the finish changes. Well, the finish changes because what I do, I think you can probably see it. I extend my choil to clear the plunge grind. See how much longer my choil is? And here's how I do it. First of all, I use a Dremel chainsaw sharpening stone. This particular one is the 732nd size. They make them in different diameters, um, not for different size knife choils, but for different size chainsaw teeth. I've used 532nd, I have 532nd, 316th, and 732nd. Just kind of depend on what knife I'm sharpening. So I mount my Dremel in a vise with the bit coming up thusly. Lengthen the choil. You cannot, you cannot raise the top of the choil or you will cause problems with blade wrap, the cutting edge hitting at the backspacer. So you can only, go, you can only move the choil that way, not this way. You've got to be very careful. So then I finish it because the, the Dremel chainsaw sharpening bit will leave kind of a gnarly looking finish. So then I finish it on the edge of my 1x30 belt sander picture here. Just sort of bring that around the edge of the belt, belt sander to give, give myself a nice satin finish to finish it off. Then I'll usually go in with the corners of my sharp maker uh, rods and just chamfer that sharp edge that I created and then I'm ready to go. Then I'm ready to sharpen. I can get nice clean consistent cutting edge all the way to the base. That's how that works. Okay. There's another thing I want you guys to look at real quick. That cutting edge not only is it overly broad and an angle too acute really for the profile of this knife blade. Notice how it doesn't really look flat and it's not that consistent in level of polish. If you could look at it closer, you'd see that it's almost convex and the level of polish is super inconsistent. That's kind of what I was talking about with uh, flat stones and proper angle compensation between grits. When you're sort of hunting for it, you end up with a convex edge. Not that convex edges are bad, um, but you know, contrast what you see here with my M4 pair of two. Okay. <clears throat> That's why that preparation phase is so important. Um, before I transition to the spider codes here, this indicates frustration to me. So Daniel has gotten so far back to try to get this little horn off of his cutting edge, which he's never going to do riding up that plunge grind, that he's, he's <laughs> time after time rammed his stone into the, the handle. Um, one thing that causes that, and I'm going back to these sharp corners again, when you start to round off the corners of your stone, in order to get in order to get good uh, cutting abrasive all the way to the back of the edge, if you have a big radius on the corner, you have to really back up to get to the flat part, and you're going to come into contact with your handle. So, just another another reason to keep your corners sharp. On a lot of knives, in order to clear the handle, you know, if this is the front of my edge pro table, I'm actually going to have to make a few strokes, sort of compensating strokes at the base of the edge with the knife kicked out a little bit, just so I don't have to, uh, so I don't have to hit, hit the handle. 
now let's talk about the Spiderco plunge grind. Again, we're going to be into the sharp corner topic. You guys have seen paramilitary twos and other Spidercos with 90 degree plunges, and the edge will usually start oh, 330 seconds past the shoulder, and then there's some unsharpened edge that comes back. Now Daniel's tried to get in there on this knife, but not too successfully, so he ends up with a recurve back there. So here's what I do. First thing I do, if I've got a virgin spider co, is I grab a diamond plate, and I bring that knife, keeping the, keeping the line of this shoulder on the same line as the corner of my plate, you know, not like this, not like this, but keeping those two lines in line with each other. And then I'm going to try to approximate the factory angle. And I'm going to ride this corner of the stone in order to get consistent edge all the way to the shoulder. And I do that first on the diamond plate because if I tried to do this with my 220 Edge Pro stone, I'd wear the corner off it right away. So I like to eat up that unsharpened material on a cheapo diamond plate um, so I don't eat through my stone so quickly. So once I've got that established all the way to the shoulder, I'm ready to go. So what you want to be sure of as you're sharpening, and you may have to turn your knife on the table a little bit when you're making your strokes right at the base, but you want the stone, just like we were doing on that diamond, we want that stone to be moving right along the line of that shoulder. Not like this, not like this. And I want to be putting pressure even maybe rocking the stone into that corner ever so slightly to make sure I'm getting, I'm always getting abrasive on every stroke all the way into that corner. And I'm going to do that on every grit. And if you guys have looked at my spider codes that I sharpen, well, they pretty much all look like this. Always, you're always going to get a little bit of polish variation back in that corner because it's hard for polishing media to have that 90 degree corner but look how good that cutting edge is all the way to the back it just takes it takes well prepared abrasives and the right touch to get that but it, they just look so much nicer when they're like that because if you don't get them back all the way over time subsequent sharpening is that little tiny bit of recurve that Daniel's got is going to be a big huge bunch of recurve and then it gets well it just gets ugly <laughs> gets ugly Looks like he did a little, well, he did a lot better job on this Gail Bradley. That's kind of how it should look right there. But if you notice, he's digging into his uh, shoulder a little bit. So the angle of his stone wasn't exactly uh, parallel to that shoulder. Because he's digging it just a little. Okay. Let's see, I promised we would talk about tips, didn't I? This is so hard to illustrate on a video. That's why I really haven't ever done it. Okay, let's see if we can get a good shot of this valet. That tip is very blunted. Here's what happens. One of two things happens. And most of you guys who do this, are going to know that both your hands are different. So for me, when the knife is in my left hand on my Edge Pro and my right hand's operating the handle, I have a tendency to put pressure to the tip side of my stone, which that is a bad thing because that's what causes that blunted tip. But I really have a tendency to roll off. Even if I'm not snapping off, which is... You, an absolute no, no. You never want to snap, snap, snap. Because if you're if you're hearing the stone snap off your tip, you are blunting your tip. You always want to stop your stroke with the tip still on your stone. Okay, so always stop with the tip still on the stone. Never snap off the end. But what I have to be really conscious of is not putting pressure to the outside. I really have to focus on almost overcompensating, putting pressure to the inside. And then what I'll do is, if I'm doing things right, I'll almost end up with, 
you know the last tiny bit of tip not quite cleaned up then what I'll do is I'll just go right to the tip and just work the tip trying to keep the stone perfectly flat until I get you know I'll do a few strokes and look until my tip matches the width and finish of the material leading up to the tip and then I'll just make a few strokes to blend it and I'll call it good because um, it, it, if I don't leave um, leave myself that little extra step with the stone in my right hand I'll round my tip on the other side it, I'm almost opposite my pressure tends to be to the inside of the stone with my left hand don't know why it is it just is so we learn to compensate if our muscles don't and our, if our muscles and brains don't learn to talk to each other consistently from hand to hand we got to compensate just like number of strokes I don't know why but when I'm working the uh, the right side of the blade stone in my right hand um, handle in the left I tend to remove more material with a given grit and a given number of strokes than I do the other way you know my, are my pressures different they must be so I'm always having to look at am I, how's my symmetry how's my symmetry do I need to go back to my first side and make a few strokes to even up the width of my bevel okay see what haven't we covered what have we not covered I'll tell you what let's just walk through Daniel's bunch of knives and see if we can see anything we haven't talked about yet so here's his uh, original 940 we've talked about this area we've talked about the recurve and the hump in the edge we've talked about his convexness and his lack of being in the same plane from grit to grit. We've talked about poor blade uh, surface preparation. We've talked about round tips. Let's see. And here's his 940-1. Boy, this is just a crying shame. $270 of S90V blade. And it really needs to... Uh, I would say it needs to go back to Benchmade for a new blade for 35 bucks, But then you still have a destroyed handle. Not the right knife to learn on, my friends. Wrong steel, very little margin for error. Um, I'd much rather see you guys go out, uh, go to a garage sale and buy a drawer full of crappy steak knives to get all your bugs out of your system uh, before you do this to a knife. I got a feeling this was uh, run through a knife shredder before it saw the Edge Pro. It was probably too far gone to be redeemed by the Edge Pro. Am I calling this the right name? Is this a valet? I think it is. Same issues. Needs a choil extension. Angle too acute. Rounded tip. Here's one. We got a, a little spider monkey from Southern Grind. This is a little better work from Daniel. A little bit of a challenge at the base of the edge. The plunge grind just barely clears. And he, you know, you can see he just didn't quite get to the back of that edge without a little bit of a horn and a little bit of a recurve. But this must be a later knife because this is better work than most. And a blade that really lends itself to being sharpened better than the more than the other ones we've seen. Here is that G10 Griptilian. Kind of the same issues. Most griptilians, large and small, I can get to the base of the edge. Some I can, some I can't, without causing this big flare at the back. The key is choosing the right angle. 17 degrees per side on a griptilian is about as acute as you want to go. And then we get a nice blunted tip on this one. And then one of the <laughs> Not, not hard to sharpen knife by design of the blade, but just by the steel, the Gail Bradley too. And Daniel did a fine job on this one. A fine job. This has to be one of the last knives you've done, huh, Daniel? And then the pair of two. Again, a little bit of tip blunting. 
an angle that's a little too acute and we didn't quite get back to the shoulder. And then blade preparation issues again. Let's see, that's all I can think of for now, but this is, an, uh, this is a video I really want you guys to comment on because uh, there have to be other issues that I'm not thinking of, and I, I kind of want to get into this um, in the next little bit while I'm thinking about it because I get lots of questions and I don't, I don't do a good job of saving them anywhere or writing them down. I think I've tried to answer the most common questions I get or problems you guys have, but... If there are others, please put them in the comments because if this video series needs to be two or three videos long, I'll certainly do it. Um, so if you're an Edge Pro or Wicked Edge or KME user uh, and you're having some difficulty that we didn't cover tonight, please leave a comment and we'll try to get to it as quickly as we can. Okay? That is all for this one, my friends. Grace to you and peace. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember, the word is sharp. <laughs>